Hi, everyone. It is June 25, 2021. Calls for extension of eviction ban as new deadline looms. In five days, millions may be facing eviction, having to get out of their shelter, their apartments. The White House press secretary said the separate bans on evictions for both renters and mortgage holders were always intended to be temporary. Doesn't look like it's going to happen, or will it happen? No, there. well, it's up to the CDC. It's up to the CDC. The decision, Saki said, lies within the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, which imposed the bans on the rationale that allowing people to lose their housing during a pandemic was an unacceptable public health risk. So, what's going to happen in five days? Wow. Well, if this ban is lifted, we are looking at a whole lot of people who are going to lose that shelter, and it ain't going to be pretty. Not at all. You know, it's amazing when I listen to this woman who says an awful lot, but never seems to answer the question. Isn't it amazing? All right, so this is, I guess she has social media briefings now. Um, okay. But this was, you can listen to it. I, I, I'm listening to her, and she didn't answer the question about the housing, the eviction moratorium. She well, I guess, answered it here. Administration to extend the federal moratorium on evictions, which expires mm -hmm. at the end of the month. Is that something the administration is considering, and why or why not? Sure. Well, let me first say that that would be a decision. Uh, the decision to extend the eviction moratorium will be made by the CDC based on public health conditions, and we certainly wouldn't get ahead of their assessment. As you know, the the, morator the eviction moratorium expires on June 30th, 30th hence, I think, your question. Uh, it was always intended to be temporary, and the president remains focused on ensuring that Americans who are struggling through no fault of their own have an off-ramp once it ends. Hence, we've also worked to take additional steps to ensure people are getting the support they need to stay in their homes, uh, whether they are renters or homeowners. Uh, but we'd certainly uh, defer to the CDC on their decision and their timeline. Go ahead. Yeah, in this, she says, oh, well, we gave $45 billion, you know, for rental assistance. In reading the articles, the money went to state and local governments and um, for some reason, only a small percentage got to the renters that needed the help. What a surprise. So, now, when people lose their home or their apartment, whatever, whether renting or mortgages, that was also a ban, uh, once this gets lifted, yeah, it's amazing. Rents are skyrocketing all over. An inflation storm is coming for the U.S. housing market. Not just buying, but renting. And some economists suggest the government may be misunderstanding the size of the problem. Uh, well, I don't think so. You know, when I was thinking about this, okay, you put a lot of people on the street, and if they can't find a place, eventually those people are gone. You don't have to worry about them, right? Okay. What about all of the landlords? Let's say they, well, so far, the small landlords are really hurting. And you extend this ban for another month, which is, I guess, being considered until the end of July. And landlords the small ones that really need help with, you know, they need the rent to pay uh, their bills. If they can't make it, then they put their apartments and houses up for sale. And while the Fed, the Federal Reserve, which is a private bank, 
is scooping up all the real estate. Huh. But whichever way it goes, people are going to hurt. That it's that's just what's going to happen, you know. Here, losing the roof over their heads in recent years, that has become the reality for many Americans. A 2019 study released by the Trump administration estimated that more than half a million people sleep outdoors each night across the country while many more couch surf or utilize shelters for unhoused people. Wow, that number seems to just stay steady. And you know, our economy has pretty much been, well, not good for a whole, well, certainly since 2008, 2009. No, there has not been a recovery. Yes, there might be individuals who, well, because they were okay, they think that there was a recovery. There hasn't been. So, yeah, we are in big trouble. Rents are rising all over the place. So you have people who've lost their job. You had that moratorium on evictions. They lift it, they get evicted, and now they're looking for places that are more expensive. Real estate sales are booming. Why? Hedge funds, BlackRock, Koch brothers. Boy, they're buying up all the homes to rent them out. The rental market is following suit. Great. Fed hires BlackRock to help calm markets. BlackRock, the investment firm that the Federal Reserve hired to invest, to buy up all of the assets. That's what's going on. Blackstone became the world's biggest landlord. The firm shifted its focus from traditional private equity to real estate over past decade. What a friggin' surprise. It shouldn't be. If you know about Agenda 21, 2030, uh, the economy that they are literally just pulling the plug on and, yeah, free fall collapsing, it's happening. We're no more property ownership for the individual. That's where all of this is going. Blackstone is your landlord. No, actually, it's the Federal Reserve that is your landlord. Well, they just recently, and I posted a video on Blackstone buying up an awful lot of the uh, single-family homes so they can rent them out. You know, when you see all of this taking place, you know that there's a whole lot of Americans who are really hurting. And when you get stressed, and what, what's that saying? When you, when you lose everything, you have nothing to lose, and you, you lose it? Okay. I think we're looking at an awful lot of Americans who are going to lose it. And, well, I've also been doing research on all of the random attacks the violence that is taking place across the country, Americans are losing it already. So, Blackstone, yeah, put another $6 billion into buying single family, well, $6 billion to buy a rental firm. So, they're, we're going rental. You will not own anything. 17,000 homes. Rent to own. Specialist Home Partners of America has over 17,000 homes. Now that's on top of all of the homes that they've purchased already. And we're talking, they've been purchasing neighborhoods. Okay, so the Federal Reserve handed an awful lot 
of money to Blackstone and no doubt said, buy up all of the homes. Buy as many homes as you possibly can. Blackstone is once again going all in on the single family rental market. No more property ownership. Well, here, let's listen to Ellen Brown for a second on Blackstone. Well, as the country is distracted by coronavirus and numerous ongoing protests, another too big to fail asset manager, which handles over seven trillion dollars in direct management and another 20 trillion through their proprietary software, BlackRock is coming under scrutiny by one investigative author, and she's calling for them to be broken up under antitrust laws. Ellen Brown is an attorney and author of numerous books focused on the financial sector, and she's the founder of the Public Banking Institute. Ellen, thank you for being with us today. Yeah, thank you. So you have recently written a scathing deep dive into this asset management company called BlackRock, which most people have probably never heard of. Given their size, how have they gone almost completely undetected by the public, unlike companies like Goldman Sachs and the like? And what sparked your recent write-up on them? Well, they were just appointed in March uh, to administer as much as a trillion dollars of the Federal Reserve's bailout money, that money that's allocated to purchase corporate debt. So this is basically toxic corporate debt, like like happened in 2008 when the Federal Reserve bailed out um, Bear Stearns and AIG by, by buying toxic debt off their books. And uh, BlackRock was set up then to manage those sales. And so, so that that's one reason they got the job, but this was like a no bid contract to uh, deal with a lot more money in this case, up to, up to a trillion dollars. And the BlackRock's main business is exchange traded funds, or that's their main profit maker right now. And they are the biggest exchange traded fund manager in the world. Uh, they and two others are the three big ones, and they have a controlling interest in every single big corporation in the country. And so, and exchange traded funds are, they manage uh, or they are invested in by pension funds and other funds and the funds generally control the stock market. So, so in effect, BlackRock controls the stock market. And the first thing they did with this power was to bail out themselves. They bought exchange traded funds, 50% uh, of which were owned by BlackRock. So there's an obvious conflict of interest here. And the problem is that they're bailing out the financial sector at the expense of the non-financial sector. So they are feeling no pain and all the pain is imposed on us, the people in the real economy, the consumer producer economy. Sure. At best, if you got a bailout, you had to go stim or, you know, you were lucky to get um, unemployment or to get uh, payroll protection from your bank and then you had to stand in line and qualify and, you know, many hoops to jump through. But bail BlackRock bailed itself out, no well, strings attached, you, they didn't have to go through Congress, no debate. Can you tell us how they seem to have dodged any scrutiny under the Dodd-Frank legislation? Well, the argument was that they're not a bank, which is true technically, but they're a shadow bank. They do many of the same functions as a bank. Uh, they they don't leverage like 10 to 1 to uh, as a bank does to create money on its books. And they don't, well, they don't use depositors. Um, they don't take deposits. They're not FDIC insured. And they say that they're just a passive asset manager. So they're not, but in fact, they vote the shares on all these stocks and the exchange traded funds were in trouble in March. In fact, 40% uh, of those very volatile trades in, in March that were taking down the economy were exchange traded fund trades. So they were instrumental in this market volatility and market collapse. So yep. the argument that they had to 
bail out the exchange yeah. traded funds to bail yeah. out the whole market. So they, they are obviously systemically important, systemically risky, and they should be regulated. Now, you also say that BlackRock is exploiting the pandemic. In what ways are they doing that? Um, the, the financial crisis actually started a year ago, at least. Uh, I mean, everybody knew we were in a bubble, stocks were overpriced, uh, and they all it took was a pin to break the bubble and the, the central bankers were meeting in August um, and as they do every year in Wyoming and the theme of it was how they had lost their um, lost their tools they had no, no more tools left to manage to stimulate the economy if we went through another recession so BlackRock actually made a proposal that is what what was done when we did have this collapse. So everybody was expecting a pin sooner or later and the pin, pin turned out to be the pandemic. So they were able to say, well, it was a pandemic, nobody expected it. And so we didn't expect to need this bailout, but you know, we have to do it because we got to save the market, which is true. I mean, you, if the market went down, it would be like 1929, but this should be prevented ahead of time. I mean, we need regulation in there that, um, you know, keeps this from happening or at least puts strings on any bailouts that happen. Sure. It was, yeah. Now, Ellen, uh, real briefly, um, given the risks that one entity this size could potentially pose to our entire country's economic stability, what do you propose needs to be done? And, and do you fear that we are gonna see another crash like 2008? Yes, it, it, it looks pretty obvious that we're going to see another crash, but what's happening is that the rich, the, the financial sector is feeling no pain. They're the ones being bailed out, so they've got the money to buy up all the little mom and pop businesses that are going out of business. It's going to be another case of the rich getting richer, the rich having the money to scoop up all the assets at fire sale prices when all the the small small players have to sell and we need some sort of a system that protects the public interest much better and i've written you know articles yeah. and books it's kind of complicated how we do that it's happening now i don't know if you watch any of those on youtube those in the financial uh, market and they're all pretty much saying the same thing now we are free falling collapsing and the fed is buying all the assets and they do it via blackrock listen just for a few minutes to david sirota blackrock coke robbing future homeowners no you will not own anything and you will be happy great reset it's really one of the differences here we're talking about not just buying up apartment buildings we're talking about buying up single family housing uh, to then use as rental properties what can be done about it i mean that's that's really the big question uh you know there are ways to, uh, to sculpt tax policy and regulatory policy uh, that favor uh, owner-occupied uh, real estate versus investor-owned real estate. Uh, certainly, that we've seen debates about rent control. Uh, in California, for instance, uh, there was a huge ballot measure uh, about rent control. Uh, but of course, in the ballot measure, you saw the private equity firms uh, pour a lot of money into defeating that measure. Uh, that measure would only have allowed uh, cities and towns to even enact rent control to at least keep rent prices uh, at, you know, near inflation or a little bit above inflation. Uh, and that went down to defeat. So it, it's a really big problem. It's a really big conundrum. Yeah, and as Ryan just said, BlackRock has been named one of the biggest perpetrators of this whole thing. Can we put the J.D. Vance tweet up on the screen? Um, I think that would, that's a really helpful way to sort of look at how both sides are thinking about it. BlackRock is pursuing an investment strategy that will make it harder for young Americans to own homes. The left will ignore this because BlackRock has committed to, quote, racial audits and other diversity BS. Now, David, what do you think about the, present, the premise there? Do you think the left is going to ignore this because BlackRock has done this sort of 
clever corporate signaling on social justice issues, or do you think there will actually be some movement on the left to address this? Well, look, I think it, it depends on what terms we're using here. I mean, is the left the Democratic Party? Is, right. you know, what are we really talking about here? What I would say is this, is that giant companies like BlackRock and Blackstone, uh, who have been big investors uh, in the real estate asset class, they have deep ties to the Democratic Party. Uh, they have deep ties to the top of the Democratic Party, the establishment of the Democratic Party. Uh, and that makes uh, a Democratic Party response much more complicated because of those financial ties, uh, campaign donation ties, uh, in some cases ties to uh, White House officials and the like. But I think what we're talking about the left, I mean, the left is also uh, NGOs, the left is also uh, grassroots groups, and there have been big policy fights about housing. I mean, one thing that I should have mentioned before is one thing that the government can do is, is, is essentially invest in building out more uh, and better public housing. Uh, and that has not really been part of the conversation. So my point in saying this is, is that, yes, that the Wall Street uh, involvement in the housing asset class creates a political uh, issue for a Democratic Party that has deep ties to some of those major Wall Street firms. And there is going to be a which side are you on moment here. Uh, mm -hmm. There is going to be a situation in which you're gonna, the Democratic Party is going to have to choose. Are we going to be uh, with our private equity and, uh, backers who pour lots of money into our campaigns, or are we going to be with those who are trying to deal with the housing crisis in a serious way? Two corporate parties is what yeah. we have. You're right, and, and the Wall Street involvement in the real estate market is being heavily financed by the Federal Reserve. Can you talk a little bit about what the Fed's role is and, and, and whether that could be a lever point for uh, policymakers to unwind some of this? Well, sure. I mean, private equity, one of its most lucrative schemes is to essentially uh, uh, rely <clears throat> on uh, low interest rates. So when the Fed floods the country uh, and the bank, the banking system with money to keep interest rates low, uh, very low, super low, uh, that allows private equity to borrow lots and lots of money in order to make these purchases. I mean, I think that's the thing a lot of people don't understand about private equity. It's not just the private equity firm coming in to, to purchase, for instance, single family housing. It's that private equity uses what we call OPM other people's money. Uh, and when, when, when you've got interest rates artificially low and cheap money flowing around, that serves pri private equity. Now, I'm not saying you, know, we, you want necessarily super high interest rates either, but that is part of the way that this works. The other part that's worth mentioning is there's a huge amount of pension money uh, in uh, private equity firms. And a lot of people don't think about this either, which is that uh, government uh, retirees and workers who pitch into their uh, public retirement system, a lot of their money is going into these private equity firms, into these private equity real estate investments. That's the money, that's a, another piece of the OPM that's being used to do this huge uh, real estate buy-up. Uh, will you see public pension funds say, hey, we don't want our money going into investments that essentially uh, uh, harm communities across the country by wildly inflating uh, real estate prices? We haven't seen that yet but that's a huge leverage point as well yeah and they're not using any of those leverage points because the world is for the super rich the federal reserve is buying up all of the homes in our country um wealth redistribution anybody all right so I now I just want to show you you know some of the um, those in the financial industry posting videos the Fed just lit the fuse for a liquidity liquidity crisis and I'll link below to all of these if you haven't been paying attention we're in really bad shape Disturbing times, worst inflation in 30 years, food supply at risk of a complete meltdown. And, yeah, that's what's going on. You know, I just bought a honeydew melon, which is, it's a kind of small honeydew melon. It was $12. Have you ever been, you know, at a 
cash register and you're, you know, checking out and paying. And then the total comes in and you're shocked. And, well, people are around you, so you just kind of grin and bear it. And you walk out. And then you look at the receipt. Uh, I bought three things at the store. A bottle of water, honeydew, two bottles of water. Um, I was shocked at how much it was. And it was the honeydew melon. Twelve dollars? Okay. Well, it seems to be the last honeydew <clears throat> melon I'm going to be buying. Okay. The U.S. economy is collapsing faster. It's collapsing fast. Stock market, new record highs. This market is only for the rich. It is not for anyone else. And even those who are in their own homes and own their own homes, I'm sorry to tell you, eventually that home you will be out of. You know, you will end up poor and jobless. Risk is skyrocketing. Investors are delusional. Evictions. Jeremiah Babe. You know, what I've been listening to, I'm like, okay, people are walking around, you know, hoping, hoping that, oh, I have a little bit of time to do what I want to do and Then you have an awful lot of people who are walking around who are just clueless and want to remain clueless. And, you know, it's like, whoa, okay. Then you have a lot of people who believe the literal horseshit that is being sold to them by mainstream media and government officials and Biden. You know, we had another um, close to half a million people who were first time... Um, filers of unemployment. Again, the the employment in a whole lot of the country, service sector, waitress, bartenders, who rely on tips. So it's almost like they rely on donations. Guess what? A whole lot of people don't even have any money. Um, prices rising fast as inflation hits three-decade high. Why everything is about to cost more, the money GPS. How about Doug Casey? Panic will come. This is a formula for total and complete economic collapse. Yesterday posted. How about uh, Jack Chappell? Chapel or Chapel. Uh, We are living through the scariest economic experiment in history right now, and no one knows it. Well, uh, some people do know it, and they know that the sheet is about to really hit the fan, though it's been hitting the fan for an awful lot, for millions upon millions upon millions of Americans for a very long time. So, and it's not an experiment. This is wealth redistribution to the very, very rich, to the Federal Reserve to own everything. See, that Great Reset, you know, the the promo for the Great Reset, and it starts with, you will own nothing and be happy? Well, you, because you're just the useless eater cattle that they think you are, the very rich will own everything. The central banks. Why 97% will lose everything when this happens. Jim Rogers. Scary prediction. Yes, it is. You know, and then I see this. Washington state forces nearly everyone to buy long-term health care. What? Okay. A new law in Washington state the first in the nation to force people to buy long-term care insurance. No matter what your age, your bill is $0.58 cents per $1,000 gross income with no caps. 
Healthcare Partnership. Okay, you can check it out. Um, it's uh, okay. Free market? No. Forcing people to pay taxes now to uh, in Washington long-term care insurance? Really? Well, you know, I would assume that this is going to go to court, and can you be hopeful that the court will actually rule that this is illegal? You can't now, because courts, all institutions have been infiltrated by people who really don't care about you at all, and they just want the job done to continue to go down that New World Order road. You know, you, and it's so insane because of how this law has been drafted. Um, you must have paid into the system for a total of 10 years without an interruption of five or more consecutive years and work at least 500 hours during each of the 10 years, or you must have paid into the system for three years within the last six years from the date they apply for benefits benefits and worked at least 500 hours during each of the three years, and then that requires thinking. Okay, um, but the employer is going to be taking it out and paying the state. Okay, you have an opt-out but your opt-out time is from October 1st, 2021, and December 31st, 2022. And if you don't, you can never opt out. Um, and you must have other long-term care insurance. Wow. Okay. So you're going to have to pay either way. Now, the younger you are, the more you are screwed. These, these terms that they have set up is really, <laughs> I don't get it. Um, it's beginning January 1, 2024. But wait a second. There was a uh, January 1, 2022. Oh, starting January 1, 2022, the tax will be 58% of employees' wages beginning January 1, point 58, sorry, uh, and beginning January 1, 2024, and every two years thereafter, the tax will be set at the rate no greater than 0.58% necessary to maintain the solvency of the program. The tax applies to all wages, all wages, uh, including salary and hourly wages, stock-based compensation, commissions, bonuses, holiday pay, most paid time off, and severance pay. There is no cap on the amount of wages in which the tax applies. Employees must, employers must collect um, and then pay the state. Unions exempt. Self-employed individuals are not subject to the tax. Uh, your maximum lifetime benefit, 36500 Your maximum benefit is $100 a day. No benefits until January 25. So you're going to be paying in from January 1 of next year and you don't see any benefits until January. Well, I hope, I hope nothing happens that you need that long-term care. Um, if you are currently in need of care, you can't join the program too bad. <laughs> I don't, well, check it out, you guys in Washington, um, because this is really yet another way to get more money from you and you're not getting a whole lot of benefit from it.
So, again, Bank of America crashes the transitory party and sees four years of hyperinflation. Wow. Inflation trends running hot as margins hit record highs. Okay. Uh, on an absolute basis, mentions skyrocketed to near record highs from 2011, pointing to, at the very least, transitory hyperinflation ahead. Inflation risk was most prevalent in materials, consumer sectors, and industrials. By category, mentions of pricing, plus 36%, transportation, plus 35%, um, rose most. Materials, plus 28%, labor-related uh, related mentions, rose the least. By the way, salaries are not increasing. Everything else is increasing. Hmm. Well, so... A serious bank warning of hyperinflation, transitory or otherwise, was enough to spark very serious concerns that the Fed was losing control of prices. Oh, the Fed is not losing control. Fed knows exactly what it's doing. Deutsche, Deutsche Bank joined the chorus earlier this month when it warned inflation was about to explode, leaving global economies sitting on a time bomb. And I'm seeing more and more articles, inflation, asset, and consumer prices. I apologize. I was just interrupted, and I can't remember exactly where I was. But let me read this. Consumption in America and Britain has been stimulated with unprecedented monetary inflation aimed at consumers and been met with limited supply, leading to strongly rising prices across the board. In short, Unless urgent action is taken, the possibility of a hyperinflationary outcome has become a possibility. The only alternative is to stop monetary inflation and thereby deliberately crash the global economy. So we're getting closer and closer to that place that a whole lot have not yet felt, and they will. You know, I'm coming across more and more articles, the horrors of hyperinflation. And, yeah, um, I'll link below. Policymakers need to ask, what is worse, hyperinflation or global climate change? Hyperinflation or social injustice? Hyperinflation or war? The answer in each case, hands down, apparently is hyperinflation, by which I mean rapid and accelerating increases in prices, caused by new money growth that outstrips new money demand. Federal government should be focusing on the real essential threat to the nation. White supremacy is not it. The runaway prices is it. Yeah. So, it just goes on. Deutsche Bank issues dire economic warning for America, also mentions hyperinflation. And you can just check it out yourself. You know, all of, all of, well, some of whom I've watched for years and more. I mean, it, it's remarkable how consistent they all are in terms of what is taking place now. You know? Just warned of a frightening market crash. All right. Um, are we ready? I don't think a whole lot of people are ready. And 2022 is going to be much worse. Of course it will be. You know, and then we've got the drought. California. Uh, that's, you know, it, where do we get our fruits and nuts? California. The drought. That is manufactured whole lot of farmers are just, well, can't water, so, you know, they're just leaving their land, their crops, their, but it's not just California. It's in Arizona. It's, well, pretty much the West. That's a whole lot of farming 
that's going down the tubes. Food shortages, higher prices, it's all coming, you know. And th this container ship prices, oh my God, now we've hit $100,000 a day for, you know, the shipping and the containers and $100,000 a day. Okay, supply chain disruption. You know, I, I mean, going to stores, are you able to buy the things that you want? Are you seeing the empty shelves? Medicaid enrollment swells during the pandemic reaching a new high. Medicaid, when people have no money and they need some kind of insurance, Medicaid. All right, we're in bad shape. <laughs> On the verge of the unthinkable. Well, it's been thinkable for a lot of us. We have become accustomed to expecting the unexpected, but soon we may have to start anticipating the unthinkable, unimaginable. It's coming. So goes into the heat wave, which is manufactured, the epic mega drought in the western half of the country, 88% of the West is experiencing at least some level of drought. Triple digits, 8 o'clock in the morning. Wow. And can't see where that was. Tucson, 100 degrees at 8.14 a.m. When summer had not even officially begun. Now, man can raise the temperatures. I have a playlist. Weather modification, check it out. Palm Springs, California, 123. Salt Lake City, 107 degrees. Never seen anything quite like this in the state of Utah, um, but it's happening all over, and dramatic water restrictions are being imposed on farmers having to choose which crops will die. Now, the water wars, water is going to become very, very expensive, but there's no shortage. Primary water, you know, that the water in our underground aquifers, but hey, just believe what they tell you. So, um, you know, if they pull the plug on that moratorium for evictions, and I fully understand that landlords are really hurting. The small ones are really hurting. They need the rent. The $45 billion, what was it, the American Rescue Plan, it's not getting to them. <sighs> you know, I just wish people would really understand what's going on. Computer chip shortage. Why, why? Why is Taiwan's semiconductor manufacturing company that makes most, almost all of the world's most sophisticated chips, why? One company? Why can't we make them here? Oh, we could, but why? Why produce anything here? Well, we used to be a manufacturing co country, and people actually lived decent lives. That was the strong middle class. All of it deliberately destroyed. We rely on Taiwan. We rely on China. Um, we've left ourselves vulnerable. Americans, you need to start asking some questions. You know, and I saw this, 900,000 jobs available in Texas. Employers to hold job fair events in Dallas and Fort Worth. Okay, what the jobs are, I don't know. But what is Texas? It is one of the most powerful mega regions in the world. Comes in number seven. Texas Triangle, Dallas, Houston, San Antonio, and Austin. Why am I bringing this up? Because it's all connected. 
You want a job? Go to Texas. Or go to Georgia, Atlanta, or where the mega regions are. And Texas Triangle, yeah, it's, it is a powerhouse, a global economic powerhouse. The Texas Triangle, an emerging power in the global economy, uh, an economic Godzilla, the Texas Triangle of big cities, including San Antonio, Austin, it's a force to be reckoned with. You can't find jobs anywhere else? Go to Texas, because they want you in these mega regions. And I have a lot of videos on it. You check out my Agenda 21, Agenda 2030 playlist, and you'll understand. This is how they move people into areas that they want them to be in. The Texas Triangle, a rising mega region unlike all others. BlackRock and other hedge funds, well, um, are buying up real estate in Texas. Oh, you might find a job, you'll rent because we're in the Great Reset. You will own nothing, and you will be happy. I hope you're all prepared for what's to come. What's to come actually in five days. Now, millions, mil tens of millions are facing eviction, eviction. And then the numbers who are facing, oh my God, mortgage. Now I have to pay it, whatever the conditions are, you know, I don't know, but we're looking at a whole lot of our fellow Americans really struggling. So I hope you're in good shape. Uh, you usually, it's been pretty much standard affair. You don't hear from those struggling. So don't think that because you're not and you happen to still be, you know, uh, within the I'm not struggling yet crowd, you think that things aren't that bad. Don't think that. People are falling into that struggling condition every single day. And unfortunately, it is true. Unless you're one of those insiders, you too are going down. However, that comes about for you, I don't know, uh, flooding your home, burning you out, uh, collapsing the uh, economy completely, it's coming. And unfortunately, a lot of violence is also coming. So there's a lot to consider. Protecting yourself financially, physically, oh, and mentally and emotionally. All right, guys. I'm going to post um, most of this, not everything, what I think is most important because I can't. It's, I don't have enough space in the description box. But I don't post these to bring you down. I post the videos because awareness of what is happening well, it generally motivates action to protect oneself as best they can. Ciao, guys.